generative methods are not yet entirely established in architecture, but they do have interesting approaches to offer and are set to become increasingly important in this field as in many others. Thus argues Urs Hirschberg, who is Professor for the Representation of Architecture and New Media and also Head of the Institute of Architecture and Media, IAM, at Graz University of Technology, TU Graz in Austria. And he's also, of course, one of the contributing editors to the Atlas of Digital Architecture. In this lecture, he describes how generative methods already form part of ordinary or manual digital architectural practice and distinguishes between generative methods used in an interplay with fitness functions for optimization purposes and approaches such as rule-based systems and shape grammars that are used in the design process. In this short lecture, I will give you a brief introduction into the use of generative methods in architectural design. I should probably state right away that many of the things I'm going to show you aren't really quite common in practice yet. But I will also argue that this will probably change in the future. There's a good chance that generative methods are going to become much more common in architectural design, and I will try to explain why I think that will be the case. But let's start very simply. When does it make sense to use generative methods? When does it make sense in architecture to automatically generate a form rather than designing and modeling it by hand? Well, what does by hand mean? Actually, by hand already means using the computer nowadays. And the computer programs that we use to model things by hand um, CAD programs, computer-aided design programs, or so-called 3D modeling programs, they come with a variety of commands that you know, make it easy to model 3D forms. You could say that many CAD commands are really many generative methods. Take, for example, the array command. It produces a field or a volumetric arrangement of objects in one go. With a polar array, I can, for example, create a spiral staircase very simply with one command. So an array is maybe the most basic kind of a generative procedure. But of course, it doesn't stop there. Today's CAD programs all have some sort of possibilities to write scripts or macros that extend their capabilities. Users can define their own commands. This can be done with a scripting language such as Visual Basic or Python, or it can be done in a visual programming language, such as Grasshopper or Dynamo. With my students, I use Rhino Python a lot, but we also use Grasshopper, which is more visual and very popular at many architecture schools. What you can see here is a model of the famous Maison Domino, which Le Corbusier published in 1915. It's a basic building type that can be built very efficiently. As you can see, this isn't the original Maison Domino. It's a parametric version of it. It's a simple script that generates a different version of the Maison Domino depending on the parameters I set. The number of floors, the spacing of the columns, the room height, etc. Everything can be controlled with a separate parameter. This is a basic example of a parametric model. I'm using Grasshopper to demonstrate it, but actually, it's a fairly simple script that was written in Rhino Python. It's an example from a class I teach to third semester bachelor students. They learn how to script in Rhino Python. In a parametric model, different dimensions of the geometry are controlled by parameters and are linked. Here you can see how the number of stair steps is adjusted automatically when I change the floor height. Stairs are actually perfect examples of building elements that can be parametrized. There are formulas that every architect learns about which define the proper relationship and minimum and maximum size of rise and run. They are also regulated in the building code. So it's easy to put this code into computer code and to create a parametric stair model. That's why most architectural design programs or building information modeling programs will have some kind of stair module 
which allows you to generate a code compliance there with just a few clicks. With the parametric tools that we've looked at so far, we can easily create a little city of domino buildings, all with different parameters. Here are some student projects that do just that. So far, so boring. We can see how this kind of generative methods could be used to create entire cities of bland buildings that all look more or less the same because they were generated with the same parametric model. In fact, using the Maison Domino, which is really the prototype of a mass-produced modernist housing scheme designed over 100 years ago, is a bit silly as an example for parametric design. When you say parametric design, what people think about is fluid forms or complex irregular forms where it makes sense to use the computer. But what the parametric domino does show and why I'm using it here as an example is that parametric design can be used for whatever you want. So if you like boxy simple shapes, you can create parametric boxy simple shapes. No problem at all. So parametric design is not a style per se. The advantage of using a parametric model in any case is that it makes it very easy to create countless variations of it. So easy, in fact, that even a machine can create those variations. And this is actually important because it opens up one area where parametric models become really useful, and that's optimization. Now, architecture and optimization are in terms that typically go together. Architecture is an art after all. It's about harmony, beauty, taste, things that we can neither measure nor optimize objectively. On the other hand, there are aspects of architecture that can be measured and not just cost. How much energy a building consumes, how much CO2 is wasted in its construction, these topics are no longer just questions of money. In the world we now live in, with climate change, with biodiversity collapse and scarce resources, striving to optimize certain aspects of your designs is really rather important. So if methods are available that allow us to optimize certain aspects of our designs, why in the world would we not use them? So you can imagine that an algorithm that works on a parametric model can create random combinations of parameter values and then evaluate the resulting design variations. And by trying out many different combinations of parameters and always selecting the best ones, you can arrive at an optimal solution regarding those particular criteria. So let's look at a couple of examples. Here's the famous bird's nest, the stadium of the Beijing Olympics designed by Swiss architects Herzog und Demeron and Chinese artist Ai Weiwei. The structure mimics the somewhat chaotic way in which birds place twigs to create their nests. The architects knew what they wanted the structure to look like, but they found it impossible to come up with a chaotic structure which also at the same time fulfilled some basic structural criteria. The Kaisersroth group of ETH Zurich found a solution by using an evolutionary approach. The system improved the solution in a series of iterations until the minimal criteria were met and no more red fields signaled a structurally unsound situation. Here's another example. This time it's a rather conventional housing project, which was parameterized such that certain values like floor heights or the position on the plot were fixed, but window sizes or floor sizes could be changed within certain boundaries. Here you see the algorithm trying out and evaluating different versions in quick succession. In this case, what's called a multi-criteria optimization was performed, resulting in three alternative versions of the project. Here only energy efficiency was taken into account, here only profitability, and here a combination of the two. The procedure used here, trying out variations randomly to find the fittest, 
may remind you of the theory of evolution. Indeed, there is an interesting analogy here. In parametric design, it's easy to create different variations of a geometrical form because we can do it by manipulating the parameters. So the parameters can be seen as the genetic code of a form. In biology, we distinguish between the genotype and the phenotype. One is the information encoded in the genes. The other one is the actual biological being, a plant, an animal, whatever the case may be. So in our analogy, the parameters are the genotype and the resulting form is the phenotype. Broadly speaking, the generative method can be defined as the link between the parameters and the geometry. Obviously, the genetic codes we are dealing with here are much, much simpler, by orders of magnitude simpler than anything we know from the living world. This difference needs to be stressed when compared to biology, we're dealing with utterly simple genetic codes. Nevertheless, it's a workable analogy, which is interesting because it also means that we cannot only optimize designs, we can also evolve them. What do I mean by that? It means that if we have a system in place that turns a genotype into a phenotype, we can let the computer generate various versions of said genotype just by making variations in the parameters. And if we have then another system in place that can evaluate the phenotypes based on some criteria that can be encoded, I can then go ahead and let designs evolve, which will over time get better and better in fulfilling said criteria. This, in a nutshell, is what we refer to as evolutionary or genetic algorithms. Genetic algorithms have two components. One is the generative method that turns a set of parametric values, so to speak, the genetic code, if you will, into a form. The other is the fitness function, which gives the resulting form a score, depending on how well it fulfills a given set of criteria. Here's another example of that. You can see that the model is much less predefined. It's basically a heap of rooms randomly stacked up on a site. It's a competition entry by the Kaiserswald group mentioned earlier. By going through thousands of iterations, the evolutionary process here finally came up with a layout that fulfilled the brief. As the example demonstrate, an evolutionary approach can not only be used to optimize an existing topology, but to actually come up with the building topology itself. Which brings us back to our main topic, generative methods. There are actually many and very different approaches to generative forms with algorithms and I will present some of them in a moment. But let's talk about predictability first. Some critics argue that predictability is the core problem of all algorithmic design methods. They argue that algorithmic designs will never be able to surprise or delight us because they are by definition limited by the program that generates them. So the argument goes, this means that they will be completely predictable and therefore boring. Indeed, the first projects I showed were quite predictable. Maison de Domino as skyscrapers aren't surprising. The solution for the bird's nest wasn't either. It was just surprising that we were able to find it. But this last project was different. No one had planned the shape of this building. It emerged from the evolutionary process. Still, of course, it was somewhat predictable. The rules were set beforehand. There was a particular generative process as well as a particular fitness function that led to the result. As we can see, generative methods can be used in a very tightly controlled way or in a rather open speculative fashion. And it's up to us as designers to define the rules. Personally, I think that predictability isn't the problem. It's better to think of generative methods as rules of a game. A chess game played by a master can be very surprising, even though the rules of chess are very rigid. So generative methods can surprise us because they allow us to play around so quickly and easily. Earlier I mentioned stairs as one of the most common applications of parametric design because they are so highly regulated. 
Now here are some algorithmically generated stairs my third semester students scripted. They all have the proper dimensions of rise and run, but they aren't boring at all. I think they're pretty fantastic. So far we've looked at parametric models. We've seen that they can be predictable, as in the case of the Maison Domino, or pretty fantastic, as in the case of the stairs. Now we'll look at some other generative methods and see how they break complex form. Many of them are so-called rule-based systems. We'll again start very simply by looking at what rules can look like when they're expressed in a programming language. So here's a bit of code. Two nested for loops written in Rhino Python. You don't need to be able to read scripting code to understand that it's a very simple algorithm. In fact, it's basically an array command. It creates an array of boxes in X and Y dimension. Now let's introduce a condition. The box will only be created if the sum of X and Y is an uneven number. We do this with the modulo symbol, which looks like a percentage sign. The modulo always returns the leftover in the division of integers. So if you divide an uneven number by two, that leftover is zero. In a conditional statement, zero equals false. So if the conditional is false, no box is created. However, if the conditional is true, in other words, when the leftover is one, hence for all uneven numbers, my little algorithm places a box at the according x and y coordinates. The result is this array, a checkerboard. Now I could of course also adjust the conditional and make any number of other patterns. All of these patterns have in common that they're perfectly predictable. They're like mathematical formulae. They will always have the same result. Now what if we want different results? Well then we could use a random number generator. Here I'm creating a random integer between 1 and 10. Every time my loop is repeated, the number will be different. I can now rephrase my conditional and instruct my algorithm to place a cube at the x and y coordinates only if the random number is greater than 3, which will be true in about 70% of the cases. So now I still have a perfectly simple algorithm, but every time the program is run, the result is different. And of course, now one can mix randomness with predictable patterns. In fact, this is what we do on the computer whenever we want to create something that looks natural, such as the distribution of particles in a cloud or the distribution of leaves on a tree, etc. Speaking of plants, one of the most famous generative methods are so-called L-systems or Lindenmeyer systems, named after the biologist Aristide Lindenmeyer. He found a way to encode the growth patterns of plants the way they branch and produce leaves. The basics are simple. It's a recursive procedure and it's also called a rewriting system. It's all based on strings. Strings are sequences of characters which are replaced with new sequences of characters in every iteration. So this becomes this and then this, etc. So the result of just a few recursive operations is this extremely long string, as you can see. Now each of the characters in this string has a meaning. They can mean draw a line, make a branching, or make an angle, or go back to the previous branching, etc. So when you feed this string to an algorithm that executes these meanings, the results are these branching structures, which are in this case just two-dimensional drawings which only somewhat resemble plants. But it turns out that, based on this simple mechanism, you can develop software systems that can generate pretty much any plant known to botany in amazing accuracy and complexity. In 3D, of course, and with leaves, different kinds of bark, flowers, and everything. And because, as we've seen, it's easy to mix in a bit of randomness into any generative procedure, the plants that are generated in this fashion will always be a bit different, just as in nature. Forests and bushes and meadows that you see in CGI films are all generated in this way. Now, we cannot go into more detail about L-systems here, but we might add that recursion, one of the main features of L-systems, is also behind fractals, like for example the Koch snowflake. 
In fact, you can encode the Koch snowflake as an L system. Fractals are also used to generate fantasy landscapes. Here you can see recursion at work again. The landscape gets successively finer with each recursion. Now let's look at yet another generative method. Shape grammars. Shape grammars are another powerful way to encode form on the computer. They have been used to encode architectural styles of architects based on buildings they designed. In an early paper about shape grammars, this was done with Palladio's villas. We'll, we will not go into shape grammars in much detail here, except as to say that they are at the heart of such systems as City Engine, a software that allows you to generate whole cities in a certain style. City Engine is used by film studios to create cities that are used as film sets, but it is also used in city planning to evaluate different developments of an urban area, as you can see in this example from Singapore, an example that is used in the Atlas. So again, you can see that generative methods can be used to solve practical problems as well as to speculate, to visualize architectural fantasies. Here are two other examples from the Atlas. They were created with the procedural modeling program Houdini. They are architectural fantasies that have very little to do with architecture that can be built with current technology, but I think they're quite beautiful and they're inspiring. This was just a quick excursion into the field of generative methods in architecture. We've barely scratched the surface, really, of many of the, the things we talked about, and we haven't even mentioned the use of artificial intelligence or machine learning that are currently opening up whole new ways of using the computer creatively. So, nevertheless, I hope I've been able to uh, pique your curiosity a bit and to make you want to find out more about generative methods. They're a wide and exciting field, I think. And while they're not very common in architectural practice yet, I think there's good reason to assume that they will become more common in future. And I think that's a good thing. Thanks.